So this week, Jigsaw, the eighth film in the Saw franchise, was released, and that means it's time to rank all eight Saw movies from the worst to the best. Now, before I start diving into my opinion on things and Rotten Tomato scores and all that fun stuff, give me your thoughts down below in the comments. Rank the movies for me. Kind of tell me your experience with all of it. Also, and tell me what series you want me to rank in the future. I do read those. I do keep track of those. And I have ranked series based off you guys' recommendations many times in the past. With all that said, let's start talking about the Saw movies. So for me, I've never seen any of the Saw movies until August of this year, just a couple months back. Now, I'm kind of squeamish. I'm not like the most into blood guts and things like that, though I do like really violent movies. So I'd, I was kind of nervous as to whether this series would work or not for me. So I'd, I'd avoided it for a long time, especially didn't want to go to a movie theater, watch a really violent movie, and then pass out into the seat of the person next to me. That would be a bad thing. So finally, this August, with knowing a new movie was coming out, decided to binge watch the entire series in the span of less than two weeks, which that, the Saw franchise, that is a rough series to binge through because that is a lot of intensity for less than two weeks. And it very much, so when you watch it that way, it feels a lot like the season of a TV show because the end of one frequently leads into the next one. There's some of them that run parallel to each other. And so it's a very interesting film franchise to binge watch through and to watch in that manner. And kind of with all that said, though, the way that this series decided to do sequels and storytelling and kind of telling things on top of each other uh, is very interesting and fascinating. I can't think of too many film franchises that have chosen to tell stories in this manner. And so I can really respect that about this series and even just kind of the, the idea that two movies happen at the same time and converge at the end of the second one. That stuff's really cool to me. I really appreciate all that fun stuff. Also throughout this series, I thought they did a nice job of casting kind of these lesser known maybe TV actors or B-level actors that I really enjoy seeing pop up and stuff. And they've kind of sprinkled all throughout the Saw franchise. And so even while not all the actors in the movie, all the movies are great, there's always, almost all of them have someone sprinkled in there that I really appreciate seeing them uh, in this movie. And that goes all the way from the first one and all the way to this one that came out just a couple days ago. I've appreciated that way that they've done a lot of the casting for this franchise. With all that said, let's dive into it and look at how Rotten Tomatoes has scored these movies. So, with the lowest Rotten Tomatoes score, you got Saw 3D with just 9%. Coming in at number 7 is Saw 5 with 13%. At number 6 is Saw 4 with 17%. At number 5 is Saw 3 with 28%. Up at number four, actually three and four are tied on here, you've got Jigsaw and Saw 2, both with 37%. Saw 2 actually has a lot more reviews counted for that. Jigsaw could go up or down from there. Pretty likely will change pretty drastically as more reviews come in. Coming in at number two is Saw 6 with 39%. And coming in at number one is the original Saw with only 49%, which is very interesting because you think about this franchise that, you know, it's got eight movies now, spawned seven sequels, all sorts of discussion about it, beloved by an enormous group of people. The critics have never liked it. At best, at its absolute best, it was still at a point in time where still slightly fewer critics gave it a positive than gave it a negative review. And it's just interesting to think about different opinions, different things appeal to different types of people. And this series certainly has its fans and it certainly has its critics. And it's for a very specific type of person. And for me, as kind of the outsider coming in, that's my perspective on all of this. I'm the outsider coming in. I, I would say uh, some of them are quite enjoyable and provide a really interesting experience. It's psychological, twisty, bendy type storytelling. And some of the other ones, they fell into a formula and just kind of were repeating the same beats over and over again. Finally, before I go into my thoughts on it, I did put up a Twitter poll. If you want to be involved in my Twitter polls, I put out uh, right before almost all of my ranking videos. Uh, follow me on Twitter. The link is down below in the description and hopefully on the screen as well. But here's what I came up with. The Twitter only lets me put four options in there. So between Saw, Saw 2, II, Saw 3, and Saw 6, nobody voted for the best being Saw 3. Nobody voted for Saw 6. Got a few votes for Saw 2. And overwhelmingly, with 90% of the 30 people that voted, Saw 1 was clearly the one that the majority of people picked as the best movie. Now, granted, it's a franchise where a lot of people probably watched the first one, two, or three, and then they didn't watch the rest of the franchise. And so the first one is the one that the majority of people have seen. Therefore, it's going to have a bias towards it. So this poll, pretty useless. 
But just so you know, I did do a poll. And with all of that said, we'll dive on into this. Coming in at number eight for me is going to be Saw 3D. Now, after seven years straight of just cranking out new Saw movies every single year, by the seventh one, it felt like they kind of just ran out of gas. And so just even in the title, they did the same exact gimmick that Friday the 13th did in the early 80s, which is, let's do it in 3D! Yay! And it's a gimmick. That's what that is. And when you do that, when you've got seven movies in a row and you're like, what can we do to get more people to show up and make more money? We'll call it Saw 3D! You're kind of cutting your own legs off when you do something like that and admitting you're just doing gimmicks to try and get people in the theaters and to get a little bit of extra cash. And so just right from the get-go... It moves into a far more like over-the-top version of things by having someone publicly being seen in the middle of a game and being tortured to death, which seems like a pretty drastic shift in tone. And not that the series was ever like reality-based, but so far in a direction of sensationalism that uh, kind of pulls you out of the movie a good bit. Certainly, clearly, many shots in this movie... Um, are shooting blood body parts at the screen for the sake of it, the 3D gimmick. But overall, you can just feel a series running out of gas. A series that's just playing the same cards over, the same hand, the same bag of tricks over and over again in a very tired way. And especially if you watch them kind of back to back to back without any sort of gap, it just feels so much like a series that... Um, out of ideas. And so then you have to have a big twist. If we got to end this series and bookend it really nicely. So what do we do? We'll have the guy that we haven't seen since the first movie come back, not be super involved in the plot, and then boom, surprise at the end. He's been all along helping behind the scenes, making things happen as the true apprentice of Jigsaw. I mean, it just it, like it felt like a forced twist. It's like, if this is what was going to happen anyway, why didn't he get involved sooner? So many questions that kind of come up throughout it. The actual kind of central guy in the game about the idea of someone that wrote a book about uh, being in Jigsaw stuff but wasn't actually, that's kind of intriguing to me, but the way it plays out is innocent family members of his being killed because he's failing at things. People he lied to are dying because of it. Just, it, it seems contrary to the, like the belief system of, or the philosophy of Jigsaw. And so just all, right, all across the board, a weak entry kind of pulled me out of all of it. Um, it just felt like I'm just drudging through more of the same thing, except now with a gimmick. And I don't have a 3D TV, so it wasn't in 3D, so I didn't even get the fun of the gimmick. Coming in at some, number seven for me is going to be Saw 6. Now, it, I, I watched this movie independent of outside opinion, just watching them straight together. So afterwards, I got on the internet and found out that there's apparently a stronger fan base, and the critics like this one more than a lot of the other ones. For me, uh, this one just once again felt like homework, kind of drudging through. It's happening one more time, except this time it had like a, a uh, like a message about insurance companies and the evil of insurance companies. Jigsaw, the way he's written, can come off very self righteous throughout the franchise, and so it's one thing for him to have a philosophy, but when it starts coming off like this self-righteous, I'm right, you're wrong, and um, and the way it comes off with this one just came off so self-righteous and preachy, and the movie itself comes off preachy towards the insurance industry when it's a series about people being tortured to death, and so odd direction to kind of take all of, all of that stuff. Um, so this one just... Did not sit well with me at all. And even kind of as doing research and trying to remember them um, and taking all my notes on it, I was like bringing all the memories of how much I did not like this one. I kind of appreciated the fact that Jill kind of traps Hoffman at the end, puts the bear trap on him, and then they don't even let that play out because it's a series where the bad guys have to win and, it, and you have to have kind of that bittersweet finale with all of these ones. And so then at a certain point in time, the like just the brutal bleakness of this world becomes predictable the unpredictable crazy itself is predictable and so this one just felt more of we're going through it one more time seeing another person and another set of people in a game that seems disconnected from the main storyline that's several of these later ones that was one of my big problems with it it was like 
it, the game stuff and the stuff, the police pre- procedural weren't connected. It was just different things happening at different times and just felt like by the numbers, we got to plunk in more soft stuff to happen. Sorry for the interruption, but real quick, I want to talk about the number one way that you can support my channel, and that's over on Patreon. If you don't know what Patreon is, essentially it's a place where you can directly support my channel financially, and as a reward for that, there are several perks and benefits of doing that, and several different levels of perks and benefits for doing that. So some of that is getting some exclusive reviews, behind the scenes content, special input into what videos and content I generate for the channel. Like a couple weeks back, I did a Halloween and I did a Chucky review, and that was specifically because that's what my patrons recommended that I do and that's the direction that my channel went because of their input. But the key thing is if you want to help this channel continue to grow, improve, and go to the the next level, the number one way to help me out is to support me over there on Patreon. So look at that description down below. See if it's the right thing for you if you want to help out the channel. And as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Let's get back to talking about the Saw movies. Coming in at number six for me is Saw 4. Now for me, this is where the franchise just kind of shifted into kind of that forgettable mush category. Where the first three had things about them that just uniquely popped, stuck out to me. I remember those ones distinctly, what happened, where they went. And then it kind of went into this zone of where the mythology, the timeline, the flashbacks, the games, it just starts mixing together a little bit for me and I can't distinguish which one is which terribly well in my mind because they're so kind of jumbled with the way they decided to take things. And so even though I took a bunch of notes as I was watching the movies back in August, um, so I could actually do this ranking video that you're now seeing, uh, I, I couldn't. Re- I was having to do homework over the last couple of days to remind myself and where things were at and which ones I liked and why I liked them. And this one kind of disappeared the most. Now, there's one of the most memorable kills in the franchise in this one was in that scalp pulling thing. <laughs> so I guess some credit to the one that made me most go, Ugh, gross. Uh, it gets credit for that. And then as you get to the kind of the final twist in it of, oh, Hoffman's evil. Oh, Donnie Wahlberg finally died. Oh, the autopsy was in the end. Like, I remember those twists. But as for a movie, the big picture of this one just kind of disappears to me. Uh, I mean, I just could not remember the distinctives of who, what, anywhere that kind of happens in it. I just remember kind of those key plot points for the franchise at whole, as a whole, and then the girl's scalp being ripped off. And so for me, this one uh, was pretty weak um, and just kind of in a jumbled mess of kind of saw movies that just just kind of happened out there. Coming in at number five is Saw 5. Now, in a lot of ways for me, this one has a lot of the same problems as Saw 4 in kind of feeling like it was so dense and deep into the mythology things at a point in time where it was just stacking things, where in senses it kind of got forgettable for me and meshed up. But as I was looking at it, I was like, no, like this is what I remember. I remember largely because of, as I mentioned earlier, just kind of the cast of characters picked. They cast Julie Benz. I really like seeing Julie Benz and stuff. So seeing her being (laughs) tortured might not be the way I necessarily want to see her, but it made me remember it. And I remembered kind of the like lesson being learned in that. And they're supposed to work together. And as they get to the end, they realize, oh no, we were supposed to let everyone else survive. And this is going to be really rough because we didn't do that. And so some of those, like I remembered those aspects of it. There's actual cat and mouse stuff with Strom and Luke from Gilmore Girls kind of with their back and forth. Um, you get the very <laughs> memorable smashing of Luke from the Gilmore Girls there at the end. I think Strom is his name. Um, and so there's a bunch of things in this one that popped a little bit more than the ones lower on this list to me. And if you kind of got into that era of this franchise where they're just kind of going through a format, a template that they have, you have to have the game, you have to have the police procedural, and you have to have their big twist reveals at the end. Of those ones in the franchise, this was one of those perhaps stronger entries for me of kind of this bottom section of the movies. It was my favorite of that batch. Now, as we move up into the top half of these, I think the top ones all have something that makes them a little bit more distinctive, watchable, and enjoyable. The bottom four here, I I think that they... They're just too much repeating certain beats, certain ideas, uh, and blend together a little bit too much. That's why they're the four at the bottom. And as I go to that, this top four for mine, 
Each one of those have something about them that makes them distinctive for me. Coming in number four is Jigsaw, the film we saw just a couple days ago. Now, if you watched my review for Jigsaw, I was a little bit too harsh on it. I'd probably increase my rating on it just a little bit, whereas my rating was very heavily based off my criticisms of it, which I will stand by and talk about in just a second. I didn't factor in as much how much more watchable this film is than some of the films lower on this list in that uh, if you had to tell me, hey, which Saw film do you want to rewatch? Jigsaw would probably actually be even higher up on my list the ones that are just more watchable, rewatchable in kind of watching the investigation of it, watching the way it plays out, the way it's lit, the aesthetic of it. And so I, my review is probably a little bit off on how I rated that one and kind of my final conclusion on it. But with all that said, when I say all of that, there's a seven year gap between the previous films and it functions as a reboot of the series. You can watch this movie without having seen the previous films and it stands on its own, whereas that all those kind of later Saw films are so kind of stacked on each other with mythology and elements to them that you kind of have to see it in the context of the franchise to follow them. So to watch Saw 5, you have to watch Saw 1 through 4 to get to that point. Whereas Jigsaw just functions as a standalone movie. It clears out the clutter of all the complex mythology that I that is kind of neat about those movies and kind of makes them difficult to watch and follow because so many things are happening at different times. And uh, you have to remember whose name is what scene, who got what information at what point in time. Whereas this one, it clears that out. It's real straightforward. There's a game going on. There's people trying to stop the game from happening and figure out who's behind it. It is John Kramer life. And so in that, like I said, the key phrase on this one, it's a lot more watchable, a lot easier to stomach. It gets rid of a lot of this, like people being ripped to shreds on screen as they're screaming for five minutes and you're just watching bones stick out. It's still gory, but it's not gory the same way. And it doesn't handle gore in the same way. There's extensive gore in autopsies, but it's not like people being just like ripped to shred and skinned alive and things like that. that you kind of see in some of those later Saw movies. And so that makes it more watchable. Now, my negatives on this one is that they just went back to the same bag of tricks and the same exact twist. And so I'm assuming you've seen the movie already. And so the first big twist reveal we get was we figure out, oh, the game was happening at a different time. Oh, wow, mind blown. That's how John Kramer's alive. Before the movie started, my buddy turned to me and he goes, what's going to happen, the way that they're doing all this John Kramer stuff is that the game's taking place years before when he was still alive. That's going to be the big reveal. We're watching the movie. They make that point. We turn to each other and we go, there it is. And as you're watching the movie, the timeline doesn't really sync up quite right. You're you're like, the uh, um, you know, our lead characters in the game are in a room and then a body shows up somewhere else. That body was in the room with them. And we don't have a scene of, you know, someone walking in and figuring things out. You notice these people that are in the middle of the game aren't talking about Jigsaw. So there's several different things that heavily, heavily, heavily tell you where this is headed. And you get to the end of it, and it's the big reveal that um, our, our autopsy man, as it turns out, uh, he's the guy that survived that first game and then they kind of like, we find out John Kramer has a soft side and like he, it was an honest mistake and so he let me live it's like is this the same John Kramer that we saw in those previous movies is Jigsaw's got this this light side to him the guy failed the test <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't make it um and so that felt a little bit like they're cheating in the way they handled that and then the, the big reveal is there's another secret apprentice so Time frames off, Secret Apprentice, we're just going to that same bag of tricks and pulling out the same tricks. And then the other thing that you find in a lot of these Saw movies is just the way the plot line in the games work out is this guy has to go over, walk over there to try and exit out those doors that he's not supposed to exit out of. And if he doesn't do that, the rest of the movie doesn't work out. But he did do that. So he just happens to step up at the right place so his luck falls in just the right spot. Now, he's given a choice to pull a lever or not. Of course, he chooses not to pull the lever, and then the people choose to walk inside of the grain silo. The grain silo fills up, and at this point in time, then he decides to pull the lever that frees them. So, like, all this stuff, like, it has to play out in just the right way, that people have to make exactly just the right decisions for it to play out. And then you move on to the next scene in it, and uh, when uh, the one guy gets kind of pulled up the bike sale guy gets pulled up there he has to be standing in just the right location has to exactly make a specific decision for him to get pulled up and all this stuff to happen 
And it kind of, and especially with the big twist reveal at the end, which is the bodies that are showing up at the end of the movie, or throughout the movie, are different bodies from the ones that we're seeing in the game we're seeing. That means all of these coincidences of people making the same choices and dying in the same ways in the same exact order. The, the coincidence had to happen two times. That's four. Two times, in which case all that's kind of pulls me out. And maybe I shouldn't raise my score back up. That's that's the reason that this one for me was like, I, it's more watchable. It's more palatable. It's, it's handled in a way that you can, uh, it's probably directed a little bit better, a lot cleaner. But just the writing in that just so contrived and pulling back that same bag of tricks, that's... Uh, that's where this one ended up, where it did for me. So coming in at number three for me is Saw 3. I actually really enjoyed what they did with the plot with this one and specifically the game going on where they got Robert the Bruce from Braveheart as this guy bitter over the death of his son and the injustice of it. So he's put through the game to learn the value of life and face all the people that he blames for the injustice. That's actually kind of compelling the way that played out. And then along that, with that, you got Jigsaw dying, a nurse trying to keep him alive. And so there's a context for all of Jigsaw's virtuous messages and lecturing about the value of life that fits a little bit better into the plot than most of the other films. And so this is when I kind of tracked with a lot more, remembered the plot to it kind of beat by beat far better than any of kind of the later sequels in this one. The actual twists in the end of it of uh, whether that be um, the wife is, or the nurse lady is, is um, Robert the Bruce's wife, that um, it's set up in such a way that because of this hatred that he can't get out of his heart, that causes his wife to die, that Jigsaw doesn't trust Amanda, and so then she's all in the wrong. All this stuff, I thought this one just was like crafted much better, like of the, the sequels, just crafted really nicely and felt like they figured out their model, their template, but it was right before they'd hit that point in time where they were just rehashing and repeating sorts of ideas and kind of losing their step. This one for me was the one that uh, just I, uh, that kind of worked together really nicely. And actually, this one potentially could have been higher up on my list, but this is also when the franchise shifted so heavily into the torture to where the, like the the... If the scalp was just the one that made me go, oh, the worst as I was watching this, the one where the guy that's the, the drunk driver guy's in the device and they're twisting his bones, and the scene goes on for five minutes as he, ah, ah, that's probably the scene that in the whole franchise that traumatized me. Those was just like watching this, like, oh dear, watching this is almost as bad as being in it. Actually, it's probably not. I'd rather watch that scene than be the one in the device there. But even the way it kind of played out where there's the shotgun and trying to get someone's head get blown off. Now, this one just, a lot, like, the actual traps in it were a lot more... I stuck... Remember, remember the freezing person, the person in the... With the chum... Not chum, or the body parts being... Bloody stuff being sprayed on him. It just stuck out to me kind of beginning to end. This is actually the, probably the one that had the sharpest memories of where it kind of went throughout the whole thing. And uh, so the two things I really didn't like about this one was that they, the way they handled our, um, the amount of torture and just like sitting there watching people screaming in agony, that kind of knocked it down as well as uh, killing off Dina Meyer just real quickly right at the, the, the beginning. Um, I guess it, it goes to a point to where the story was going later in it of Amanda setting up tests that can't be beaten. And so it sets something up, but once again, when... People are just dying when there's no meaning to it. I start getting frustrated with where the franchise is going with things. And why would you, why would you kill off the girl from Starship Troopers? It just this just seems mean spirited to me. And uh, she was also in Birds of Prey, that CW show about uh, where she was Oracle. Um, so one of those long lost CW shows. Anyway, I'm rambling a little bit, going off on a tangent. So this one could have been higher. A couple of those things just knocked it down a little bit for me. Coming in number two for me is going to be Saw 1, the original. Now this one was so close, so, so, so close to being number one on my list. Like many people have it on number one at their list for a lot of the obvious reasons. It's got the best director of the bunch, the most innovative direction, storytelling, all of it invented the template for the Saw movies uh, in what James Wan was able to do with this movie. So in and of itself, that kind of makes it just the most interesting because it was so fresh and original. From there, you got the movie in the franchise with by far <laughs> the best cast. Whereas mo all, almost all the movies in the franchise have someone in there that I like seeing. 
This one's got Carrie Elwes, Don, Danny Glover, Monica Porter, Porter, uh, you know Nicholas Cage's wife from Con Air. Uh, you got Ken Lung, one of those character actors from television. I love it when he pops up and stuff. Tobin Bell, kind of in this role that kind of has defined this latter part of his career. To me, he's always the bad guy from season two of Twenty Four. But then for other people, he's the guy from Saw. And you got Michael Emerson from Lost and Person of Interest. I actually know him more from Person of Interest as Harold Finch, but. It's like just jam packed with people I love to see in movies and in TV. And so this whole movie is very watchable because it's jam packed with people that I love seeing. It invented the Saw franchise. And to the point of uh, what many people have said about this one is that whereas the later movies just kind of shift into that torture porn, watching a guy just being torn to shreds in a, a device, this was a lot more psychological and is not a fraction of as graphic as you think it is. It's not a fraction of graphic as its reputation because it'll start showing uh, Carrie always starts sawing his leg off and you see a little bit of blood and then it cuts off to like him in agony and that's just as like, whoa, as actually seeing the, the <laughs> sawing slowly through his leg. Um, and so that, that one for me kind of, uh, all those are the positive of this movie. Now, shifting to the negative side, this one has some of the weakest acting of the franchise, or most noticeably bad acting, because a lot of that horrible acting is coming from people that can act better. Carrie Elwes is is not good in this movie. Huge chunk of the movie is just him in a room, sitting on the ground, acting, and I don't think he's doing a very good job. It's the worst I've ever seen him is in this movie, and that's not good. It's not good when so much of the movie rides on the shoulders of his acting ability, and we get his worst performance. And so that, that's a key one that just makes the movie go, ooh, drop down quite a bit for me. And uh, being that this one had the lowest budget of all the movies in the franchise, it feels like the one with the lowest budget in the franchise. Um, and that, that doesn't help things a whole lot. But it, uh, like I said, there's a lot of great things in here. It's number two on my list. Thoroughly enjoy the, the setup for the world that they gave where you do kind of have um, this side to like this dark serial killer type thing with this police procedural going on. And in many ways, kind of if you were to create kind of a franchise model version of Seven, if Seven is fine dining, this is the franchise fast food version of Seven. It's a nice version of that, and it did that. It, it created kind of a fast food version of seven. That's what this movie established, created the format, and now we've got eight of the, this fast food version of seven that we've received over the years. And so, very cool movie. Um, James Wan is a very talented director with a great cast, and very much appreciated that it's not nearly as tortury and just gory nastiness as, um, well, as the movies ended up going in later direction. That's not the psychological side made this one much kind of more fascinating, deeper watch for me. But coming in at number one for me, a little bit to my surprise, is actually going to be Saw 2. Now, I felt that what this movie did is it took the ideas of the first movie and expanded upon them in ways that took it to that next level. So we get a lot more in a first-person perspective of Tobin Bell's John Kramer Jigsaw. We actually get to spend time with him and get his worldview. And so just in and of itself, as a, as a sequel to the first film and an expansion of the mythology of the first film, it was doing it the right way. We're getting time with this guy that's behind all of this. And that was so kind of limited in the way it could be handled in the first film. This movie gives us a lot more depth to the way that's handled simply because he's there and he can do his little lectures and his mythology and his uh, preachy type stuff directly to us along those same lines Donnie Wahlberg I like seeing Donnie Wahlberg and stuff so seeing him as our lead guy and I fit, thought he felt nicely into this kind of tale of the the cop that wants to solve anything and he's angry and he's impatient and he's starting to force through and try and force things to happen and so that kind of drives our story forward a, a little bit more to kind of see what's going on with a forward momentum a literal ticking clock making us care about when things are happening that drives the urgency of the story forward the fact that the game ties to the main things kind of going along with it um, and you know there's a room full of people that there's plenty of opportunities for games traps high death count um, crazy stuff happening uh, lends itself well to the franchise and gives you kind of what you want with kind of the urgency importance to it with the way the first movie works since a lot of the flashbacks and the way it handled it this movie gives you an urgent forward moving storytelling version of that and then as you get to the plot twist at the end of the movie like 
Oh, it was happening at a different point in time. Oh, there's a secret apprentice that's making things happen. Oh, he didn't. Oh, Donnie didn't follow the rules, and that's why he's in trouble. That's why certain things are happening. All those kinds of things are why, for me, this one felt like a great companion and expansion of the first movie that had just kind of clicked a little bit more, hit a little bit harder for me, delivered a little bit more of what I wanted in kind of edged out the first movie, at least at the moment in time where I'm doing this ranking video. And I even wonder how much even more so this one could have been even better, stronger, greater, if James Wan had been the one that actually directed this one with the additional budget, with the experience that he had before, was able to take his stuff to that next level, fascinated by just kind of those what if type situations. But there you have it, that's my ranking of the Saw movies, my thoughts on them. There's kind of four that I got some enjoyment out of and four that just kind of jumbled together and kind of, kind of started rehashing things a little bit to me. In particular, those top three, I thought had a lot of kind of interesting, cool ideas to put in there, kind of thrilling, horrifying type situation to put yourself in um, that makes for a fascinating franchise to exist out there. But what do you think about it? Tell me down below in the comment section. I'd love to hear your take on it. Also, if you're new to my channel, please consider clicking that subscribe button. I do movie reviews, TV reviews, and ranking videos like the one you're watching right now. I do these every single Saturday, so let me know what franchise you want me to rank in the future. Put it down below in the comment section. Coming out next Saturday, I'm going to be ranking all 17 of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies in under 10 minutes. That's going to be a new one for me, under 10 minutes, which is tricky because I like to talk a lot. And as always, thank you so much for watching.